Doctors are supposed to operate under the maxim, do no harm. But history shows this has sometimes been easier said than done. The annals of medical history are filled with some bizarre treatments. Today on History Bizarre, we're talking about the most disturbing and barbaric medical treatments in history. But first, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Bee venom therapy, which involves being willingly stung by a live honeybee or injected with bee venom, dates back to the time of ancient Greece, when Hippocrates purportedly believed in the medicinal value of bee venom to ease arthritis and other joint problems, according to the American Apothecary Society. Epithery refers to all medical-related therapies that are based on bee products, including bee venom, honey, or pollen. The reason it may help is that bee venom contains melitin, a chemical thought to have anti-inflammatory properties. Although bee sting therapy is promoted for relieving the pain and swelling of arthritis and for preventing relapses, fatigue, and disability in people with multiple sclerosis, there is a lack of scientific evidence of its effectiveness for these two conditions, and it is not approved by the Food and Drug Administration for this use. Not only is there limited research on its benefits, but the treatment itself may be harmful to some people. A review study by researchers in South Korea, published in 2015 in the journal PLOS One, concluded that people frequently get adverse reactions to bee venom therapy. Risks can range from minor skin reaction and pain at the sites of the stings to life-threatening anaphylactic reactions in people who may be allergic to the venom. These days, bee venom therapy is more commonly used in Asia, Eastern Europe, and South America than in the U.S., where it is considered an alternative medical therapy. Compared to other treatments described in this video, Maggot therapy is fairly new, having been used for about 100 years, said Dr. Ronald Sherman, an internal medicine physician and director of Biotherapeutics Education and Research Foundation in Irvine, California, a nonprofit organization that promotes the use of live animals to diagnose and treat illness. The treatment consists of applying live baby flies or fly larvae to a wound. Military surgeons first observed maggots to be beneficial when injured soldiers who remained on the battlefield were found to heal quicker if flies were allowed to lay eggs in their wounds. By 1928, a Johns Hopkins physician developed a way to cultivate medical-grade maggots and make them germ-free before their use in treatment. In 2004, the FDA issued a clearance that allowed maggots to be marketed for medical use on wounds that are slow to heal, such as diabetic foot ulcers and bed sores. They also may be used for chronic leg ulcers, post-surgical wounds, and acute burns. Maggot therapy is done by applying the bugs to the surface of a wound and covering it with a dressing for about two days. The hungry critters secrete digestive enzymes that can dissolve the wound's dead and infected tissue a process known as debridement. Maggot therapy fell out of use in the 1950s with the widespread availability of antibiotics, but has re-emerged in the 21st century with the rise in antimicrobial resistance and hard-to-treat wounds. Maggots are very good at getting rid of rotting flesh, Sherman told Live Science. But one hurdle the treatment often needs to overcome is the yucky factor. Our culture equates maggots with death, dog do, and stinky garbage. Leeches are primitive worms, Herudo medicinalis, that are equipped with suckers on their front and back ends that let them feed on blood and teeth that can make a quick, clean cut. These qualities make leeches useful for bloodletting, a medical practice that removes blood from the body and dates back to ancient times. In the 21st century, the FDA has cleared the use of medical leeches for a condition called venous congestion, in which blood pools in a particular area of the body and the veins can't pump it back to the heart. Venous congestion may occur following surgeries to reattach a limb, such as a finger or an ear, for example, or other major surgical reconstructions, such as a breast. Leeches can extract a significant volume of blood from a surgical site in a short amount of time about 45 minutes, which allows more oxygen to reach the site. 
In addition, the saliva from leeches contains substances with anticoagulant properties, meaning they can prevent the blood from clotting. One major risk of leech therapy is anemia or a loss of too much iron. It's also possible to get an infection at the site where the leeches bite the person's skin. The most common reason for modern-day bloodletting, which is now called therapeutic phlebotomy, is hemochromatosis, a genetic disorder caused by an overload of iron in the body. When too much iron accumulates, it can be toxic to the liver, heart, pancreas, and joints. To rid the body of extra iron by therapeutic phlebotomy, a doctor uses a needle to draw a pint or more blood from the patient once or twice a week for several months or longer so that the person's level of ferritin, a protein that stores iron, falls into a healthier range. Therapeutic phlebotomy is an extremely effective treatment for hemochromatosis. Scott Podolsky said, it does the trick. For thousands of years, medical practitioners clung to the belief that sickness was merely the result of a little bad blood. Bloodletting probably began with the ancient Sumerians and Egyptians, but it didn't become common practice until the time of classical Greece and Rome. Influential physicians like Hippocrates and Galen maintained that the human body was filled with four basic substances, or humor, yellow bile, black bile, phlegm, and blood, and these needed to be kept in balance to maintain proper health. With this in mind, patients with a fever or other ailment were often diagnosed with an overabundance of blood. To restore bodily harmony, their doctor would simply cut open a vein and drain some of their vital fluids into a receptacle. In some cases, leeches were even used to suck the blood directly from the site. While it could easily result in accidental death from blood loss, phlebotomy endured as a common medical practice well into the 19th century. Medieval doctors prescribed blood draining as a treatment for everything from a sore throat to the plague, and some barbers listed it as a service along with haircuts and shaves. The practice finally fell out of vogue after new research showed that it might be doing more harm than good, but controlled bloodletting are still used today as treatments for certain rare illnesses. Although not considered ancient because it was first developed in the late 1930s and introduced in the U.S. about one year later, electroconvulsive therapy ECT may have gained a modern-day reputation as a barbaric treatment when it was famously depicted in the movie One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and administered unwillingly to Jack Nicholson's character. Once known as electroshock therapy or simply called shock treatment, ECT involves passing electrical currents through the brain either by implanting electrodes in the brain or placing electrodes on the scalp according to the National Institute of Mental Health. Electroconvulsive therapy may have developed a negative reputation from its past use when the therapy might have been used inhumanely with high doses of electricity, without anesthesia, and over many more treatment sessions than it is given today. There's definitely a stigma attached to electroconvulsive therapy, and many people may be frightened of it even in its uses today. But in modern medicine, ECT is used for people with a condition called treatment-resistant depression, which is a severe depression that has not improved with medication or other treatments. Today, ECT is done under general anesthesia and is typically given three times a week for three to four weeks. The treatment affects brain chemicals and nerve cells and can produce changes in mood, sleep, and appetite, according to information about ECT from the University of Michigan Health System, Department of Psychiatry. The most common side effects of ECT are memory loss, confusion, headaches, and nausea. We hope you enjoyed another episode of History Bazaar. Please hit the like button and subscribe to the fastest growing history channel on YouTube.